Hello, and welcome to everybody who is joining us by Zoom or by Facebook Live for this conversation with Professor Fawad Azadi, who is a professor at the University of Tehran and a dear friend of mine who I spent time with during my recent trip to Iran in uh, October of last year. Fawad, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for uh, having me. Hello to everybody who's uh, watching and listening. And I hope that uh, the minutes that uh, we'll spend together would be fruitful for everybody. So I know we have uh, some new things that are happening today, new sanctions being imposed, but I wanna just start off with asking you what the atmosphere is like on the ground right now and what it's been like for the past week. You know, um, the country um, has been under sanctions uh, for many, many years. Uh, just an hour ago, uh, the United States government announced uh, new sanctions. And um, so the sanctions uh, are uh, designed uh, to pressure the government, the Iranian government. But in reality, they uh, pressure ordinary citizens more than uh, anyone else. Uh, we have some people in Washington that want to change uh, the Iranian government they, they are for regime change, as they call it. I uh, remember reading uh, John Bolton's uh, tweet after the assassination of the Iranian general. The last line of that tweet said that we need to have regime change. So Bolton is not in the White House, but uh, there are a lot of people that uh, think in similar uh, lines and believe in uh, the same concept. And um, some of them at least would like to pressure the Iranian people so they come to the streets because of economic difficulties. And uh, that uh, that's a way of overthrowing the government by uh, sort of putting pressure on ordinary citizens so they, they get tired of uh, economic hardship and they do something about it by changing the government. And I don't know uh, that that has ever worked. This is not the um, first time that the U.S. And, has, uh, has tried call, that. The U.S. government calls this. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, it, 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 you know, uh, one place that is it, it has not worked is Iran because it has been practiced for uh, many decades, and uh, you, you don't see. Uh, the government falling. In fact, uh, after the assassination of the Iranian general, uh, we had this uh, nationalism uh, uh, sort of uh, enhanced uh, and uh, people, uh, actually a lot of people uh, rallied behind the government. Uh, so the aim is to change the government, but in practice, uh, a lot of people here realized that it was the United States that left the nuclear agreement. And uh, uh, many people uh, blame President Trump for the economic difficulties that they have, uh, not, not their own government, not President Rouhani. And the end result is that maybe um, the Trump administration wants to change Iran's government, but what they are doing is actually in a way uh, is helping the government by uh, justifying uh, some of the mismanagement because they can always blame the United States uh, for, for the economic hardships. And uh, uh, from what we've seen here, uh, the government is not about to fall. Uh, they are uh, sort of dealing with the difficulties that they have. Uh, and uh, uh, the assassination of the Iranian general uh, actually uh, uh, resulted in a new generation of Iranians sort of uh, uh, feeling anti-Americanism the same way that the generation that uh, orchestrated the 1979 revolution uh, felt that way uh, uh, because they, 
thought of the general as someone who is uh, providing security for the country. Uh, we had a lot of uh, US think tanks and media outlets that uh, 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 thought of him as someone who had uh, fought ISIS. Uh, in fact, Newsweek uh, had a cover story a couple of weeks ago talking about the fact that uh, if Iran is pressured more, uh, it would be a win for ISIS. Uh, and, and uh, you know, during the time that ISIS was uh, uh, taking over a lot of territory, uh, Iran and the United States sort of were working um, in a way together uh, to uh, confront that uh, 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 confront that uh, sort of ISIS advances. Uh, but after the ISIS defeat, the United States government seems to have forgotten the contribution that Iran made in terms of fighting ISIS. And they assassinated the general that was in charge of uh, uh, ISIS uh, fighting activities of Iran. <clears throat> so overall, now, uh, I think. When, uh, when the assassination took place, when, when I saw the news, um, I know I, I was quite shocked and surprised just at the, at the brazenness of the Trump administration to assassinate such a high level uh, member of Iran's government. Uh, what was the, was there shock and surprise on the ground or was this more expected um, given the U.S.'s past interference in Iran? And if you could talk a little bit about uh, the history of U.S. interference in Iran. You know, uh, the history starts from 1953 uh, with the coup d'etat. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are always difficulties in countries, but uh, this is a sign of disrespect, I think, when uh, a third country, another country comes and tries to overthrow a, a government in, 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 in a manner that the United States did in 1953. So uh, Iranians are uh, proud people and they, they generally don't want interference from others, even if they have internal difficulties. Uh, so they don't, they don't like the disrespect. And I think a similar feeling was very much present when uh, the news of the assassination of the general was uh, announced a lot of people felt uh, disrespect. Um, you know, uh, bef a couple of months <clears throat> before uh, the uh, assassination news, the, we had this, uh, demonstrations in Tehran, uh, other, other cities uh, against government policies. Uh, and uh, so the country was very much divided uh, and what the assassination did was that it actually uh, ended in uniting the country against uh, a foreign force. Uh, and um, so we had, I don't know if you have seen the uh, videos, we had um, hundreds of thousands, some people estimate millions of people in different cities uh, showing up, not necessarily supporting the government, but opposing uh, the assassination uh, of uh, 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 general that was uh, quite popular in public opinion polls. He was actually the most popular uh, individual in Iran uh, because he did not get into uh, political faction fighting. Uh, he served the country. Uh, people thought of him as someone who's serving the country and protecting the borders. Um, so when you assassinate the most popular uh, person in a country, you will uh, have uh, people coming to the streets, and that's what happened. Uh, and, and in a way, uh, U.S. action uh, united uh, the country and actually helped the government solidify its uh, its power. Because uh, at the end of the day, they could point to President Trump uh, as someone who is disres disrespectful of Iran. And that message was reinforced by him when he 
threatened to attack Iranian cultural sites. And um, so a lot of people uh, uh, thought that uh, he is someone who doesn't like uh, Iran, not just the, the government, because the cultural sites are made by Iranian ancestors. That's, you know, the historical sites are not, are, you know, you have visited Iran. Some of them date back 2000 years ago. So when you disrespect a country's uh, cultural and historical sites and you threaten to attack these sites, which is a war criminal, war crime, uh, then you are sending the signal that, uh, that there is a level of hatred against the country uh, of Iran, not just the current government. And um, so the way President Trump uh, tweets and conducts uh, his business is uh, basically uh, making a lot of people think uh, that, that his animosity is with the Iranian people uh, more than the Iranian government, or at least at the same level as the Iranian government. And we have been reading the news of Iranian Americans. I'm not sure if any of them are listening to this broadcast, uh, but Iranian Americans who uh, went to Canada for the holidays, when they came back, although they were US citizens, they were questioned. Some of them spent uh, hours answering questions and sort of this type of uh, harassment is uh, something that uh, bothered a lot of people, which is another sign of the Trump administration not liking Iranians, even the people, Iranians who have gotten US citizenships. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this is tragic, uh, I think. And uh, I hope the uh, people who are listening uh, would uh, re realize the damage that the Trump administration is doing to the United States and its uh, status internationally. And the opinion of uh, people in Iran is, uh, really uh, turning against the US government, even the new generation, the younger generation that did not experience the 1953 coup d'etat or even don't remember the Shah are developing the same type of feeling towards the United States as their parents and their grandparents. So I want to, um, I want to go back to sanctions, but before I do that, I want to let uh, everybody who's joining us know that we will be taking questions. If you're participating through Zoom, you can type your questions in the chat box. And if you're participating through Facebook, uh, watching the Facebook Live on Code Pink's Facebook, you can email any questions to me. My email is ariel, A-R-I-E-L, at codepink.org, and uh, we can ask them of Professor Fawad. So back to sanctions, uh, one of the things that's been especially concerning for me and um, for all of us at Code Pink, has been the report that uh, humanitarian aid, life-saving medicines in particular, uh, such as medicines for cancer and epilepsy, and to treat injuries, uh, eye injuries, sustained by the use of chemical weapons during the Iran-Iraq war, are not making it into the country. And uh, this is despite the Trump administration saying that the sanctions, um, that, that humanitarian aid is exempted from the sanctions. So I'd like to ask uh, what you see of that in terms of uh, medicines not being able to come into the country, um, any of those effects that you're aware of? You know, uh, the Trump administration is true that the, uh, is saying the truth that the uh, sanctions legislation exempts uh, humanitarian uh, material, medicine, food, and stuff. Yeah, they're actually correct. Uh, that, that's what the law says. But the problem is that uh, in order for Iran to import medicine or uh, the humanitarian aid that they need, they need to pay for it. And in order to pay for it, they need to have banking transactions. And it's practically impossible to have uh, banking transactions uh, because of the sanctions. So the sanctions exempt humanitarian aid and medicine, but they don't allow Iran to pay 
for the medicine that needs to be bought. So in practice, although medicine is not sanctioned, in practice it is sanctioned. And you can uh, see that uh, every day. You know, I uh, take uh, blood pressure uh, medicine, which is uh, a very popular medicine. It's uh, a lot of people have blood pressure. <clears throat> and for a while, uh, I couldn't get my medicine. And the medicine uh, was actually made by uh, an Iranian company. But the reason that they couldn't uh, provide that to the pharmacies was because a, a small portion of that medicine, a component, was coming from abroad. So they made more than half of the medicine internally. They had they had this stuff to do it internally. A little bit of it was coming from outside. And because they couldn't get that a small portion, they couldn't make the medicine internally because of that component. And they couldn't get the component because they couldn't pay for it. Not because they didn't have the money, but because of the banking sanctions that existed. So even for uh, blood pressure medicine, uh, people had difficulties. And there are some medicine that are not made internally. So they have to buy the whole thing uh, from outside. And that's even more difficult. And we don't know how many people have died in the last uh, many months uh, because uh, of uh, the United States uh, uh, talking about exempting medicine, but in practice, and not allowing medicine to come in. Uh, we had the issue of instincts, this setup that the European um, uh, uh, countries wanted to create uh, for uh, uh, this type of exchanges that Iran could actually pay uh, for medicine and other things that Iran needed uh, under European supervision. And uh, just an hour ago, uh, US Secretary of Treasury uh, announced in the White House uh, that uh, they're going to sanction people who are involved with INSTEX, this European initiative that was designed to uh, basically uh, resolve some of these problems. Um, so it is sad to say that uh, although you, the US government officials talk about uh, supporting Iranians or wanting to help Iranian people, but in practice, they are not even allowing them to get the medicine that they need. And I'm not sure how these guys uh, sleep at night, uh, knowing that they are killing people on a daily basis, but uh, apparently they have no problem sleeping. We at Code Pink do not sleep well at night, um, knowing that. And we have a, a question. Um, who would, uh, Steph would like to know, what do Iranians think about the in sex system um, to circumvent the banking sanctions? Do Iranians expect it to become a reality at any point, given how delayed it's been? And then I want to add to that, that uh, when Mnuchin announced the sanctions today, Mnuchin and Pompeo, they um, outlined that INSTEX, in fact, would be subject to secondary sanctions. So that this might affect the question as well, but uh, do Iranians feel any hope uh, for this system um, and any sense of, of uh, foreseeing that it might ever be implemented? You know, um, after uh, the US left the nuclear agreement in May of 2018, it's about you know one and a half years uh, almost that, that the US left, uh, Iran uh, didn't want to leave because the Rouhani administration uh, negotiated uh, very hard for two years to get that agreement. And uh, what the Iranian government said was that uh, we want to stay, but we need to uh, get some benefit out of the agreement. And as you may know, the European governments also did not approve of the Trump administration leaving the agreement. And they came up with this project, INSTEX, that would allow Iran to pay for medicine and other humanitarian aid that Iran needed. And Iran has been waiting for this initiative for over a year now. But in practice, not even $1 was allowed to be transferred to the other side. 
it has not started working and given uh, what uh, Mnuchin, Secretary Mnuchin said uh, about an hour ago, uh, I, I don't, it, it seems that it's not going to uh, uh, operate anytime soon. So the question is uh, uh, whether it's going to uh, start or not. I think that was the question. And based on what we know, the answer is no, because the US government uh, wants to exert maximum pressure campaign. And part of that maximum pressure campaign is to prevent Iranians uh, from getting the medicine that they need, it seems. The Pompeo today said that uh, when Iran struck the US base in, in Iraq, that they had full intentions of killing U.S. forces. Um, of course, uh, I know that you and no people, uh, ordinary people can can know for sure the full intentions. But if you could say, um, what is what is the feeling on the ground uh, from the Iranian people about that strike and the fact that it not only did not uh, hit any U.S. forces, it also didn't hit any Iraqi forces. Um, do the Iranian people think this was intentional? And um, are people glad that it didn't hit for uh, didn't hit people, uh, or do they wish that um, there had been uh, a larger hit that way? You know, I I think you know me um, long enough to know that I oppose war, so I I don't <laughs> like. Uh, um, uh, I don't like the fact that, uh, uh, you know, governments uh, engage in uh, uh, activities that result in people dying. Um, but what happened was that after the killing of the general, uh, uh, th th this is what I see um, uh, in, in the people that uh, people, uh, some at least, uh, became scared that the U.S. is uh, basically uh, doesn't have any limitations on use of force. They, uh, if you kill an, a general, and you know the Iraqi prime minister issued a statement saying that the, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, general was carrying a message. Uh, the Iraqis have been mediating between Iran and Saudi Arabia for, uh, for some time. And uh, the general was, uh, was carrying a letter which had Iran's answer to that mediation effort. And he was supposed to meet uh, the Iraqi prime minister at 8 a.m. Uh, and he was assassinated a few hours before, uh, before he could do that. Uh, so when people in Iran saw uh, that the United States uh, is uh, willing and able to uh, kill a general when he's on an official visit, uh, even there were announcements that he came through normal channels. He got his passport stamped like anybody else who's visiting a foreign country. And uh, when they see that, then uh, people become concerned that maybe the United States next step would be to attack Iran as we have some uh, US politicians uh, talking about. Uh, we had Tom Cotton, the Senator, I think he's from uh, Arkansas, if I'm not mis mistaken, uh, talked about uh, a war with Iran would be one strike, trying to say that it's, it's going to be an easy, easy job. I remember uh, Dick Cheney talking about uh, Iraq war being a cakewalk. So that type of mentality exists still in some uh, US politicians. And if they have that mentality and if they have influence with uh, President Trump, and uh, then uh, who knows, they may want to orchestrate another war uh, with Iran, uh, the same way they did it with Iraq. And, and obviously people in Iran uh, become very concerned because they know what happened to Iraq next door. And no one wants to experience what Iraq ex experienced in 2003. Uh, so when the strike happened, uh, some people became happy. And the reason they became happy was because they thought that, okay, the country is not weak. 
there, there are missiles that can be used. And some people at least uh, thought that uh, this is a good measure because uh, it sends a message to Washington that attacking Iran or Iranian people uh, has a cost. And so the argument here was that if attacking Iran or Iranians doesn't have a cost, because there are no ethical standards in Washington, then going to a, to, to a war would be easy, easily justified because the cost is not going to be that much. So creating cost for that type of behavior was something that some people in Iran liked. And uh, the end result is that uh, people did not have problem with people that many people that I saw and sort of talked to didn't have problem with Iran striking at that base because they didn't want to have the United States thinking about attacking Iran properly. So we have a, another question. Since this uh, most recent crisis, Americans have been paying much closer attention to the situation in Iran and, and have been taking to the streets. I would, I think we, this is probably the largest uh, anti-war mobilization in a very long time. Uh, did Iranians notice, were they aware of that and what were the reactions? You know, the Iranian media outlets actually cover these demonstrations. Uh, they, uh, the videos are available online, so they, they get uh, subtitled uh, and, and uh, on, on social media and television, uh, people see that. And they uh, actually appreciate what they see because uh, they don't want to uh, have a war with the United States, you know. The U.S. Army is much larger uh, than the Iranian Army. The U.S. Uh, spends uh, uh, over uh, $700 billion a year uh, on, on military spending, uh, 700 something. And that something is three times larger than the Iranian military budget. So I think this, the, the number this year was uh, seven. 135,000, 735 billion dollars, 735 billion dollars. Uh, and that 35 billion dollars is three times larger than uh, what Iran spends on its military. Iran's military budget is about 10 billion. So no one really wants to have a military conflict with Iran. And when they see Americans uh, also uh, coming to the streets, and opposing war and opposing militarism and opposing uh, policies that at the end of the day are going to help the United States uh, also because American soldiers uh, get killed in wars and American resources and treasure uh, are going to be wasted. When they see uh, that they are, uh, let me say, good Americans uh, that um, sort of don't want to have this type of uh, foreign policy, uh, then uh, they become happy and they realize that you have Trump and then you have uh, Ariel Gold, which, which is you know, <laughs> so, so, someone who opposes war. Uh, and, and I think that's very, that's very important that, uh, uh, because we don't want Iranians to uh, feel, have this feeling of anti-American people. That's not going to really uh, help. And, and by having these anti-war organizations participating in, in these type of activities, uh, you, you are sending this message to the Iranian people that American people, at least some people in the United States, don't want to have war with Iran either. We have a question from Julie. Uh, what if any, how, how do you feel the sentiment has changed between Iran and Iraq um, in terms of what people are talking about? You know, um, so what President Trump did with the killing of the general was that it uh, enhanced uh, nationalistic feelings in Iran. 
as, as you know, there was an Iraqi general also that was killed uh, the same night. The day he had gone to the airport to welcome uh, Iran, the Iranian general. So the Iraqi general was also uh, killed. And uh, so you had this nationalistic feelings in Iraq as well. And uh, similar to Iran, uh, not too long ago, you had demonstrations in, in Iraq against uh, the government there. And the killing of the Iraqi general had a similar result in Iraq. It uh, sort of uh, increased nationalistic feelings in Iraq. And the end result was that the Iraqi parliament voted uh, a few days ago uh, to ask the US to leave Iraq. Uh, I know that President Trump likes oil. He talks about liking oil. You know, He uses that sentence uh, often. He says, I like oil. But I think you know, the Iraqi oil belongs to the Iraqi people, not President Trump. Uh, the US is an energy rich country. Um, there are plenty of oil inside the United States. So it may be a good idea for President Trump to like American oil, not Iraqi oil. <laughs> we have another question. What is your perception of the role that Europe is playing in this ongoing conflict? Is Europe and especially Germany considered a partner of Iran? You know, um, Europeans uh, announced uh, um, their uh, disappointment with the Trump administration after the US left the nuclear agreement because as you know, we had this P5 plus one and you had, so within that P5 plus one, you had the UK, France and Germany and EU representative uh, being part of the nuclear agreement. So it was basically a European initiative that invited Iran to join and invited the United States to join. And then you had uh, Russia and China uh, in that P5 plus one as well. So um, European uh, governments and I think European people were disappointed when the Trump administration left the agreement. But since that time, uh, Europe has not been able to do much besides uh, being disappointed. We just talked about Instex. That's a European initiative, but it's not really a starting. Um, and uh, you know, before. Uh, uh, you know, just a few years ago, Germany was Iran's number one partner in terms of trade. Uh, so Iran-German relations were quite good. Uh, Iran was buying a lot of goods from Germany. And uh, because of sanctions, the, the trade between Iran and Germany is quite a small now. So we have countries like China replacing European countries uh, when it comes to uh, partnering with Iran. Um, and I don't think the European uh, governments and people like being out of the Iranian market. You know, Iran, Iran's population is over 80 million. Uh, th there are a lot of places for investment and trade. Uh, there are a lot of uh, places in Europe that need to uh, export their goods to Iran. Uh, and they're prevented to do so, and not because of what their governments want, but because of the pressure from the United States and the legislation that is passed by the US Congress, which is a violation of country's sovereignty. Uh, the US Congress can decide to pass laws that prevent American companies from trading with Iran, but passing laws that prevent German companies from uh, trading with Iran is a violation of German sovereign rights. But, you know, the US seems not to care about international law. Um, you know, the nuclear agreement was uh, part of a UN uh, Security Council resolution 2231. And US, during the Obama administration, uh, signed up 
uh, to the agreement. And so the UN resolution 2231 is international law. You know, UN resolutions are supposed to be followed by UN members. So what the US government is doing now is not only not following the resolution, the US government is sanctioning any country that is trying to follow a UN resolution, which is very strange because the US is part of the Security Council. Um, so, so that is a violation of not only Germany's uh, sovereign rights, it's also a violation of international law and UN Security, uh, UN Security Council resolutions. Medea Benjamin of Code Pink, who I know you know well, uh, would like to know if you have any thoughts on why Europe isn't doing more to oppose Trump's push for war. It's, um, I think, you know, they are under a lot of pressure from the United States. You just saw an hour ago, a US uh, Secretary of Treasury threatening Europe. You know, INSTIX is a European initiative and they, they have threatened European government officials, they have threatened uh, European companies, they have threatened uh, European individuals that are part of the state setup. Uh, they have told them that uh, they would be on the SDN list, uh, that, that's a sanctions list, <clears throat> and uh, they have told them they would never get a visa to the United States. Uh, so the type of treatment that Europeans who uh, want to follow the UN resolution get from the United States is not much different from the treatment that Iranians get from the United States. And uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's a big problem that, that Europe has. And because of historical facts, because of um, historical relationships, it's difficult, it seems, for Europe to have a more independent foreign policy. Uh, and um, so, and this is going to be damaging for themselves because they're losing trade and they're losing um, also uh, political linkage and cultural linkage because uh, of a law that uh, someone passed in the United States or the executive order that the president signed. So as we prepare to end, I want to ask, um, if there is anything that uh, the people and especially your students um, would like to see from us here across the world and, and here in the belly of a be the beast, as we call it, in America, um, if there's ways that we can show our support and our opposition to our own government. Uh, well, you know, I mentioned this uh webinar to my students at the University of Tehran, and they wanted to join and sort of come and share their thoughts. Uh, and I uh, told them maybe we can do this next time. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, the people in the United States uh, can do things that uh, Iranians cannot. Uh, they can um, uh, influence their government to follow policies that are good both for the United States and Iran. Uh, preventing war would be uh, one example. Um, Iranians cannot demonstrate uh, in Washington because of the Muslim ban. You know, they cannot come to Washington, <laughs> even if they had the money to do so. But Americans can do. And um, um, I, I, sort of fighting these type of uh, policies I think is a patriotic thing to do for the Americans because we have seen what the Iraq war did to the United States, its uh, soldiers, its uh, uh, treasure. You know, even President Trump used to, or at least until some months ago, talked about the fact that $7 trillion was basically wasted. And, and, and you know, and his policies have led the Iraqi parliament and the Iraqi prime minister to ask the United States to leave after wasting all that money and having four or 5,000 Americans killed. Um, so sometimes, to be honest with you, um, I wonder why we don't have more Americans joining the anti-war movement. And uh, given the fact that 
these type of policies hurt these Americans. Uh, the the anti-war, the, the you know war policies, militarism policies hurt people in Iran because we are on the receiving end, but they also hurt Americans because the, the country that engages in needless wars is, is not going to be uh, a, a country that people look up to. Um, so the the idea of um, American exceptionalism uh, is turning to um, the, um, the U.S. government is exceptional because they engage in a lot of wars. That's how they are exception. And, and and preventing that and fixing that problem is something that Americans can do only, not others. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us, and we would love to do a follow-up interview with um, some of your students. And so I will chat with you about that and we can figure out a day and time and we will let everybody know when that is. And um, we just want to as well, we at Code Pink want to express our uh, solidarity and support and our desires for peace and um, our love for all of you in Iran and our hope for your safety as uh, Donald Trump continues to try to provoke a war. And thank you for um, providing this forum. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm going to be available anytime you need me. And uh, students, this is the exam week. So give them a couple of weeks so they can pass the exams <laughs> and, then, and then they'll be happy to uh, be with you in, in, in the next term when they start. Best of luck to all of your students on their exams, and we look forward to that. Thank you so much for